I have uh, some general questions just to start. I think it was really, it was really very, very interesting. Um, when you do, when you develop an algorithm, or even when you do these randomized control trials, the setting at Mayo is different than the setting at many places around the country. And other large laboratories can partially mimic what you've done to really generate homegrown information. But how does a small hospital take your data and make that help them either developing an algorithm or uh, applying uh, some of this testing to blood cultures, for example? Yeah, really good questions. So uh, when, when we develop guidance around test ordering, it's obviously for tests that we're using in our clinical practice, but many of these tests are available elsewhere. The multiplex panels, the GI panels, I, I think they're very widely used. Meningitis and cephalitis panel, I don't know how widely used that panel is, but um, I suspect there are a lot of places who have access to it. Um, even smaller hospitals, even hospitals that don't have maybe a, a board certified uh, doctor level microbiologist on staff. In fact, I, I suspect that some of these newer tests are being used very commonly in, in some of these smaller settings, as, as you mentioned. So when we, when we made the algorithms that, we, that I showed you today, uh, we tried to think not just about ourselves, but uh, about other laboratories as well. And we've, we've shared them through publications um, and uh, through the web with other sites so that people can use them as well. They're hard to do. I don't know that they're necessarily completely right, but you know, we made the gastrointestinal pathogen panel algorithm for acute diarrheal illness a long time ago, and we've made very few modifications to it. You know, it's it's been out there. We use it. We use it in our own clinical practice, but we also share it. And I think this isn't a situation where every lab needs to reinvent the wheel. And I'm not saying that what we did was perfect. Uh, making those algorithms was really hard, I will tell you. Trying to get consensus around some of those pieces is really, really hard. And they may be wrong, but until you put something out there, you have nothing to, to, to poke at, right, to, to try to modify. Um, and until you then put them into clinical practice, you, you really don't know if, if they're working for you. So, you know, I, I don't think that every lab has to come up with their own personalized algorithms. You have to look at what's on your test menu and maybe borrow resources from, from other places, from other laboratories. Many smaller labs are part of bigger systems and they can get together and, and work together to do something across the system as opposed to uh, just working as uh, an individual lab and trying to do everything um, themselves. I think that um, it gets harder when you talk about executing clinical trials to assess value. I, I think that might be hard for a smaller lab to do, um, A, because there just might not be enough subjects to enroll into a clinical trial, and um, B, that because there might be other resource limitations and so forth. And, you know, it's, I think it's hard because um, practices are different and uh, the results of the trials that I showed you might have been different if they were done at different institutions. Uh, you know, we were a bit surprised to not see outcomes differences, um, hard outcomes differences like length of stay or mortality uh, when we got the results back from, from both of these trials. I mean, everybody wants to see, you know, I've got this great new test and it's, it's going to save lives. But but sometimes that's not what you see. And I, I think it's important to, to see changes that positively impact the um, use of antibiotics. But, but it may be that in a setting that has higher rates of resistance, uh, you might see outcomes uh, being affected. We, we would need trials to be able to show that. I don't think we can reasonably do a randomized controlled trial at every institution. That's, that's sort of ridiculous, right? I mean, it would be a waste of resources, but I think we can learn from each other um, one of the important pieces that we learned is that with the novel blood culture based diagnostics, you really need a good stewardship team behind it. Because if you just put out those results, especially if they're results that could guide de escalation, that, that doesn't happen readily by just the laboratory putting results out there. You need a stewardship team behind it. And I think that's something that other labs can, can adopt and, and have adopted as well. 
So do you have a, not, I know you have an antimicrobial stewardship team. Do you have a laboratory testing stewardship team? We do have a laboratory testing stewardship team and, and they're really- <laughs> how, do they, how do they interact with, with you developing an algorithm and then once you have a result, following up with the clinician who ordered the test? Right. So there's, there's several components uh, to the stewardship uh, piece. One is looking at the menu of tests that the laboratory has and, and thinking about, you know, what am I missing tests? Are there tests that I should be bringing in? Or quite frankly, tests that I should be getting rid of? That's something maybe we don't talk about a lot. But, um, you know, I have in my day gotten rid of some tests. Some of them have been replacement tests where you just, you know, you replace an old test with a new test and others have been just getting rid of a test and that can be very hard to do. So one question that your stewardship group might address is, you know, is the menu correct? But then, then there's the question of who's getting tested. You know, we want to make sure that the right patient gets the right test at the right time. That's easy to say, but it's hard to operationalize. And that means not only making sure people that don't need to be tested don't get tested, but importantly, make, making sure that people who do need to be tested get tested because we know that some tests are underutilized and others are overutilized. So we have to address utilization on both, both sides. And a lot of that for me on the ordering side has to be dealt with with, uh, with whatever ordering system you have in place at your institution. Most places are ordering tests electronically and, and so that point of contact with the test is when a healthcare provider is in a system and they're trying to figure out what to order on their particular patient and they need the guidance to take them through that. So we try to build ordering guidance into our ordering system. I think there's still a lot of room for improvement with diagnostic tests there, but I see that as really the best opportunity to provide that guidance. And so then, as, yeah. Let me just interject a question right there because it, it, I was trying to get at that. Uh, I set up an algorithm and we get buy-in from all the appropriate uh, specialties in that, but we put some caveats in there. For example, one of the uh, boxes that you had in your algorithm, you, you, there are people that have diarrhea that are not severely ill and there's those that are severely ill. It has to do with the number of days they've been sick, whether there's blood in the stool, there's mucus in the stool, you know, different clinical uh, yeah. indicators. So how do you mate ordering the test with the presence or absence of those clinical indicators so that you make sure that people appropriately order a test. Right, and that can be challenging, but I think leveraging the electronic ordering system is, is really the way to go, providing that guidance. And, and it can be at various different levels. It could be, you know, I see you're, you're wanting to order this particular test uh, you know, this test is indicated in, in these situations and not indicated in these situations. It can be requiring them to um, indicate that certain criteria are met to order that test. Uh, of course, that's, you know, basically uh, on, on their honor that, that that's the case. Um, or it can be, you know, requiring actual approval from somebody. Uh, a person, which gets much more complicated if you're trying to offer tests, you know, 24 seven and make sure they get quickly done on your patients and so forth. I think we have room for improvement in our systems uh, uh, to better guide test ordering, uh, but we, we try to work with our colleagues. We use Epic at, at Mayo, and I, I'm sure a lot of folks do, but there are other ordering systems as well. So we try to work with our clinicians who are using those systems to, to come up with uh, appropriate um, guidance as they go through the ordering process. I don't think it's perfect. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there, but that to me is, is how I see the best way of approaching um, you know, how to get there. If you have a, a panel, uh, take the, the, the uh, enteric panel, for example, and there are targets in there that you don't think are appropriate to report. Um, do you not report them? This is a this is a really good <laughs> question, <laughs> and it's it's been it's been a challenge with the multiplex panels. I will say is that they come pre-configured with whatever they've been pre-configured with, and they're cleared as such. 
So the panel that we use, we use the BioFire panel. I'm not providing an endorsement for or against BioFire. That's just the panel we use. And there are some targets on that panel that um, are a little frustrating that our clinicians don't really know what to do with, right? There's a, a lot of information. But on the other hand, um, we don't have a good way of blinding ourselves to those results. And so we report the full panel. I know some laboratories will hold back certain results, and, and I think that's, that's a reasonable strategy as well. I'm familiar with other labs that for some of the panels, such as the respiratory panels, have built out sub panels of the panels and so offer them in, in multiple different ways. There's a lot of creativity that's uh, going on out there. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's really a right answer, but we do not hold back on results. Yeah. <laughs> Are you, um, speaking of algorithms, just our panels for a, a couple more questions here. Um, when you look at your data or anybody's data, if we were to everyone to do their own testing and you look at data, you may have um, what appears to be good performance for a particular target. But when you look at the confidence interval, you know, the confidence interval runs from 30% to 99%. Um, how comfortable are you, even though the, the, the predictive value or the false positives or false negatives or whatever, the, 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 the absolute value was very encouraging, but the confidence interval is not so encouraging. How do you manage that um, discrepancy in deciding to use a particular target? Well, the data that I showed you, for example, on the meningitis encephalitis panel, which I think is what you're referring to, um, was for the, the relatively small, but I still think it's pretty large evaluation that we did here. But the complexity is that even though we're, we're talking about um, close to 300 samples that are tested across the spectrum of organisms on the panel, that's still not a lot of samples for every analyte on the panel. And we have more for some and fewer for others and so forth. So, you know, the panel is cleared by the FDA and it's it has been validated in terms of analytical performance and some clinical performance as part of of that clearance and and so I, I you know our data was not considered in isolation um, I, I think as well when you're considering um, say spinal fluid diagnostics uh, you're not performing the test in isolation. You do have the patient's clinical history. You have their cell count, the protein glucose gram stain, which is still recommended, and culture uh, coming at you. And as I mentioned, for some of the analytes, uh, like Cryptococcus neoformans, we recommend doing the antigen if you're concerned about that because we recognize that there can be imperfect sensitivity. And likewise for HSV, uh, we saw that in our study as well. Uh, no test is perfect. and um, I think that's the same for for all of all of these panels, and you know if if a clinician is strongly suspicious of a diagnosis, but the multiplex panel is not revealing that diagnosis, I think a conversation with the clinical microbiologist is appropriate, and possibly uh, another test, or sometimes we'll end up repeating the panel just to see if if that works. So you're probably familiar with these kinds of approaches as well. <laughs> Um, but it, at some point, we have to trust in our diagnostics as well. I mean, I, I mean, you know, these are these are very good diagnostics, and we can't be second guessing everything that the laboratory does. I mean, it's really the same with traditional diagnostics, culture based diagnostics as well. They're they're not perfect either. Yeah, good, good. Uh, any um, panels that are in the works that you know of, or are there any panels that you think would be good to develop? Um, I think you're going to see more multiplex panels over time. Um, there is uh, There are two companies that have lower respiratory tract panels now, and um, we are currently executing a randomized controlled trial of uh, the BioFire pneumonia panel because we end up with the same sort of questions about that panel as we had with the blood culture diagnostics early on. You know, it, are, is this valuable? Is this going to really help uh, our clinicians manage their patients? Is it going to lead to better outcomes and so forth? So 
we're almost halfway through enrollment in, in that clinical trial. And I'm excited to see it. I think uh, that there are a number of um, you know, uh, pieces on, on some of these panels that we haven't, we haven't had before in clinical microbiology. We don't exactly know what to do with all of them. And, and we'll, we'll learn a lot by, by really studying what, what value some of these tests have in clinical practice and, and whether they make a difference for our patients, with, which after all is, is why we're here. I think you'll see other panels as well. I, I suspect you'll see some, some kind of bone and joint panel. That's a separate passion of mine. Um, and, and I think you'll see others as well. Um, How about pharyngitis? Well, that's, that's interesting. I'm not, uh, I'm not per se familiar with who's working on a pharyngitis panel. Um, I feel that that could be useful. Uh, where we have a lot of blinders on in terms of pharyngitis diagnosis because we focus essentially on streptococcus pyogenes. And even there, there, I think, are questions about what we really should be doing and what we should not be doing. But there are clearly other causes of pharyngitis, including bacterial causes of pharyngitis that we know of that we don't diagnose. Uh, but I think it will come down to the same piece, right? So we'll need a panel. And then we'll need to look at whether using that panel will make a difference in clinical practice, which is, which is what I emphasized with the two blood culture studies. And I, so I, I think for pharyngitis, we're going to need the two-step approach, uh, deliver the panel, and then let's do the studies to show <laughs> whether this makes a difference for people, right? right? Because pharyngitis, you know, um, there, it's very common and, um, it's very disruptive if you or your child has pharyngitis. But on the other hand, it's not associated with substantial mortality. So, you know, it, it will have to be the appropriate outcomes that are looked at. And there will be a, a, a cost consideration, I think, as well. You know, how much are, are people willing to pay to have an answer and maybe to feel better a little bit faster? Um, I, I think we're going to be able to do it. I mean, I know we're going to be able to do it, um, but we'll have to answer the question as to what the value is. And, and that's, that's what these value-based studies are really looking at. Well, I think we're all anxious to see how your, your uh, lower respiratory tract trial comes out. And I hope that down the road, I have a chance to question you about that too. <laughs> Stay now, tuned. Onto yeah, <laughs> the blood culture uh, um, trials that you have done, um, again, a couple of general questions. You know, knowing what we know now about the effectiveness and use of those, is there a way that you decide which positive blood culture, you know, gets one of these tests and which one doesn't? Yeah. For example, if someone has multiple positive blood cultures, I would assume that you don't have to test all of them. So are there other ways that you can triage it so that you don't use a very valuable but expensive resource? Too often? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a really good question. Even in our trial, so let me talk a little bit about how we set up to that. We, we thought that would be important. It certainly doesn't make sense to me to, re, to test every patient's um, multiple positive bottles uh, with these diagnostic tests. Uh, that's going to add a lot of cost um, and, and a lot of work for the laboratory. And, and we don't do that anyway with with the conventional testing that we we do right we we would make a subculture but we don't do susceptibility testing for example on on every bottle uh, that's that's positive we we do a lot of what we call same by morph um, here at mayo um, and so when we designed the trials it was first positive blood culture bottle um, and and then we also uh, look at well if that patient had a positive blood culture, say, X number of days ago, we're not going to be retesting their new positive blood culture because it's probably the same thing that's going on again. So laboratories can, can really control who's getting tested. A lot of positive blood cultures in laboratories are, are sort of repeats, right? Same patient. I know they're positive and they're just coming up again. I don't think these tests have any value in those. We didn't actually test them in our trial because we just didn't think that would be valuable or a valuable question. Um, you might you might look at inpatient versus outpatient 
I don't know. That's a tough piece, right? Because, you know, maybe you have a chance of finding out what's wrong with your outpatient who happened to have had blood cultures done, but you, you could think about that, whether you want to just focus on, on inpatients or you want to do both inpatients and outpatients. Um, you could, if your lab can identify particular units, uh, focus on particular units. I think it's hard for us um, to, to identify which patient is, is where and so forth. We did do a stratified randomization um, and we, we actually used a computer system to help us do that. It was an algorithm that helped the techs carry out the randomization in the laboratory and also did the stratification um, uh, at the same time. And so that, that could be implemented. But I, I do think you want to do this thoughtfully. You don't want to just be testing every positive blood culture bottle or you're going to be spending a lot of time running these tests. Did you look at your data to calculate the percentage of positive blood cultures that you actually had to test to get where you got? <laughs> so if you understand my question, so let's say that you have 100 positive blood cultures. Some of those are repeats. Um, some of them you know, were from locations that maybe you didn't include in your study. But in the end, what percentage of positive blood cultures actually had the rapid uh, molecular tests or susceptibility tests applied? Any yeah. idea there? I mean, 20%, 50%, 80%, any idea? Um, I don't think we tabulated how many bottles were positive, so I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, but we, we weren't excluding locations. They were only for inpatients, these studies. Um, so we excluded outpatients, but, but um, we didn't exclude anybody else. Uh, but no, I, I didn't, we didn't look at um, how many other bottles these patients had positive or whether they'd had a, they were excluded because of a, well, we, we had those numbers, how many were excluded because of a prior positive and they, mm -hmm. they weren't large numbers. I'm just thinking if a laboratory were trying to decide whether to bring in this technology and they say, well, gee, we do you know, 10,000 blood cultures a year and 8% uh, of them are positive. Um, so we've got, what's that, 800 positive blood cultures. Would we have to test all of those or by, you know, what percentage of those? Would we be testing 400 or 200? Or That's what I was trying to get at. Right. Someone was trying to figure out sort of a cost accounting of bringing this in. Yeah, that depends on how what you're counting as a blood culture too in that in that number, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but it, it's not going to be all your your bottles. But I think you you could do those those calculations. Maybe and just one per patient or something. One per patient, and and you know another thing in our in our practice, we see patients who go to a smaller hospital that's part of our healthcare system, get blood cultures drawn, and then eventually get transferred to us, and we can see everybody's data because they're all within the same Mayo system. But if their blood cultures are already positive, even though it was at a different institution, well, different hospital before they come to us, then we won't repeat the testing here, even if they happen to have positive cultures over here. So we look not just at our own data, but whatever data our technologists can see in our laboratory information system. Yeah, well, that's good. Um, when you have an actionable result from a, either of your two blood uh, results that would come out of each of either of your two blood culture studies, are those communicated 24/7, just electronically, or is there a verbal complement to that communication? So, so that has changed over time. Um, they they are reported 24/7, where we operate 24/7. We will call the gram stain initially. And uh, what we do, what we did initially, like in the BCID study, is we called, you, people got a play by play uh, along the way. So they got the gram stain and then they got the result of the BCID called to them as well. Um, in the later study, we always call our gram stains. We have, you know, you have to call a gram stain as a laboratory, but we will let them know that there is rapid susceptibility testing that's been set up and that we give them the time frame in which those results can be expected so they know to look for them. Uh, so that's the communication that we execute. And then we communicate those results to our stewardship team as well. So this just came to my mind. It's a little bit of an aside, but I'm curious how you guys think about this. Uh, blood culture testing is getting more and more rapid and more and more accurate. Uh, yeah. Can you foresee a day when 
an identification result through a rapid test or um, antibiotic resistant targets through a rapid test are available soon enough that you would not have to call the gram stain. In effect, you would wait to report the positive until you got the molecular results, which may be a half an hour later or two hours later. Is there a time frame that you would say, I don't think we need to call that gram stain because we're going to give them more information soon enough? Yeah, that is a really good question. I, I, I think it's possible. It's just very hard right now because it's a critical result. So there, are, there's a time frame around that call, and I don't think the rapid diagnostics are quite rapid enough to to fall within that time frame. And and there's a patient care piece too, right? Um, even with the gram stain, uh, you know pretty a lot of times antibiotics will get started. So if you have someone who has a serious bacteremia, septicemia, that, that can be very helpful for them to know that as soon as it comes out. Um, but you're right, then maybe if you're running say um, a film or ABCID test, an hour later, you've got like more results that are coming out. And so the question might come up, do I, do I call them back again? Or did I let them know when I called them the first time that that's going to be out in an hour? And do I really believe they're going to go in and check and look at that? Um, I I think if those tests got fast enough that it could be possible to wait, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I also feel that, and I feel a little uncomfortable saying this to you, Dr. Thompson, <laughs> but sometimes reading gram states is hard. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, and the molecular tests are easier to run than reading a gram state is. And so for labs that don't have a lot of experience um, reading gram stains, uh, this may also be a better approach, but there's the time factor, right? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's complicated. I think we could get to that point. I, I really think we need better systems for connecting the results along the way quickly back to the patient to know what management strategy has been put in place around those results. Because, you know, if they're already on, say, the correct antibiotic for each result as it unfolds, there's no change in anything. And you're just, you're notifying lots, you're sending lots of information, but nothing's changing. And you may just be annoying the clinical team, quite frankly. But it's in those patients who are not receiving what they should be receiving, where your test is telling you that that's, those are the results that they really need to hear about right away. You know, the test is telling you, you have X, the patient's getting this kind of treatment. There's no way that's covering that X. They need to know about that very quickly. And I think that in the end, it, it may be through better computer algorithms that we get to doing the right thing for our patients. And that may help us with when and how often we notify as well. Uh, but that's very futuristic and we're, we're just not there yet. You know, another challenge, since we're talking about reporting results, another challenge that we all have is that we have a huge amount of information in hand when we've run a simple susceptibility test, let alone all these molecular targets and identification targets. This is a two-part question. The first is, do you report the same information to stewardship that you put into the regular report for the patient's clinicians? And number two, I noticed that you had a lot of target information in your um, uh, genus and species result. So staph aureus, and then you talked about MEC, you talked about the junction, you put what was there, what, what wasn't there. Um, is that necessary in the primary report rather than maybe just in a comment or in a special report that is designed for stewardship? Yeah, see, so. So I, let me just explain this because I think I wasn't, I wasn't so clear. So okay. this first column is what comes off of the instrument. I see. And That's the second how it's and third columns are what we report. So I in see. fact, we're not, and, and I know this might be different than what some labs are doing. We're not reporting MREJ. Our clinicians don't see that. And, and that is because I think that's very confusing for clinicians. So we do a translation 
uh, from the result to to what it actually means. And I realize that's a bit sticking our neck out in terms of making that interpretation for people. But I feel that clinically, as we get into complex genetic uh, reporting, the the average healthcare provider is not well positioned to be able to interpret that on their own. And and that's okay. They have so many other things that they're doing. They don't need to be an expert at understanding what MREJ is, the, in, in my opinion. And so we do a translation and what they see is the name of the organism. We call Staph aureus Staphylococcus aureus complex here. And, and then we do say MECA detected because we feel like they know what MECA is, uh, but then we interpret that and we provide you know, other guidance, including treatment guidance, uh, which again, you know, it says vancomycin or another anti-MRSA treatment. I don't know 100% that it's vancomycin susceptible. So we're, you know, we're going out on a limb here, but it does say pending susceptibility results. Right. I appreciate that explanation because I misinterpreted this table when I first looked at it. I, I thought that what you were reporting was on the left. Now I understand what you were reporting is, the, is in the middle. However, I do think that's a nice discussion of yours describing what you think is important to report, what you think is report is important to add in a comment, and then what may not ne be necessary to report. Um, but you do issue the same report to stewardship that you yes. issue to the, the uh, ordering clinician. Yes, so um, back in the day, we had different reports for different people, and, and you may remember that from back in the day, but we, uh, <laughs> We have moved away from that and everybody gets the same report. Now, obviously, you know, in the lab, in our lab information systems, we may have additional data. Um, and so if people want to know about that, they can talk to us in the laboratory, but everybody receives the same report. Another question that many people uh, ask one another is, once you've done these molecular tests, the, uh, the initial rapid molecular screening tests, or a rapid, even a rapid phenotypic susceptibility test, do you back it up uh, with a second test to make sure that they are accurate? <laughs> yes, uh, that's, that's a good question. So there are a lot of considerations here. Now, if, if you're talking about a molecular test, you still need to do phenotypic susceptibilities because you've only, you know, if you're looking at Staph aureus, you've only interrogated methicillin resistance. You haven't reported out your full panel. And so we need to take that to full susceptibility. But I'm just going to go down a rabbit hole there for a minute. You do need to make sure that when you do your phenotypic susceptibility, that it matches what you've reported genotypically. Because if you blindly report out MRSA, from say a molecular test and then report it as being methicillin susceptible from a phenotypic test, there's a problem, right? And there are lots of potential explanations for that problem, but that should be recognized by the lab right away. There should be some system built in place that says, hey, do not release until somebody's dealt with this uh, contradictory result that you've got here. So we've, we've learned that same story with VRE, right? You can, you can go through um, other examples there. With the Accelerate Pheno test, you're getting rapid phenotypic susceptibility results. And so I don't think there's a need to repeat the exact same phenotypic susceptibility testing. The challenge can be if your panel that you would routinely do on isolates has additional drugs that are not on the panel, then you may need to repeat your panel just to get those added drugs in. But I think that's a conversation you want to have with your clinicians um, to help guide what you're going to do in the laboratory. You know, if you're missing one drug compared to what you normally report, is that important enough that they would want the whole panel reported? because I don't think you need to repeat the drugs that have already been reported. In our case, just uh, to clarify how this is done, when we report the results of rapid phenotypic susceptibility testing, they look exactly like our regular susceptibility testing. 
to someone who doesn't know what's going on behind the scenes, they wouldn't be able to tell what, what has been happening. And I think that's important. There's, there's not a reason to doubt those rapid phenotypic susceptibility results. They're just as good as slow phenotypic susceptibility <laughs> results, for lack of a better term. Um, so it's just to fill in the void on maybe some missing drugs that you might want to do that, I think. So when you have your molecular results, um, and then you have your conventional susceptibility result, and there is a discrepancy, mm. whose responsibility in your laboratory is it to recognize that discrepancy and then get the appropriate report issued? I mean, it probably mm. hasn't gone out yet, but somebody has to look at it and decide mm. that it's wrong and then decide what we're going to report. Mm. Who would that be? So if you think about this operationally, the molecular result has already gone out and that's coming off of a machine that's, you know, it's, it's out. And then you get your phenotypic susceptibility results back on whatever was isolated in culture from that blood culture bottle. And there's a discrepancy. We handle that at the time of reporting of those phenotypic susceptibility results because there's a technologist who's doing that reporting, who's looking for any discrepancies. And so in a way, it's done somewhat manually, I, you know, through a computer reporting system. But mm -hmm. that could be a place, I, another place where we could use some advances in informatics, right, to to flag discrepancies for us. I think I think we need to be thinking about what we need in the laboratory, and that would be an example. But right now, um, it's it's by our expert technologists who really are experts recognizing that discrepancy and then not releasing that result right away until we have a chance to, to work it up. Now, on the other hand, you know, if they, for example, didn't find a resistance gene and, and um, the organism say it's testing as methicillin resistant Staph aureus and it's out there as methicillin susceptible Staph aureus, we will get involved right away because there might be harm to the patient potentially being caused by that. Otherwise, if the gene was called as resistant, but it's testing phenotypically susceptible, we'll, we'll work on resolving that discrepancy and then uh, decide what, what might have been causing it. Obviously, lots of, lots of possibilities, and I think we've seen them all by now. Now, uh, I think all of us feel that faster is better, but as you've shown us, we can't necessarily prove that faster is better, you know, in all circumstances. One of the measures that I don't see that often, but I think is important, is um, additional testing that the patient undergoes um, if they don't have a quick result. So we, have, we give them a quick result that gives them an answer and they now know what the infection is, they now know what the antibiotics are, um, but they're not getting out of the hospital more quickly. You know, they're not dying less frequently. They're not doing some of the major measures in a significantly different way. On the other hand, they might not go and have that colonoscopy or they might not go and have that uh, MRI or they might not go and have other laboratory tests or additional blood cultures or whatever it happens to be. I, I actually think that there's a, a fair poundage of uh, testing that could be um, avoided with quicker. I don't know if you have thought about that or if you guys tried to show that or it's just too hard to show or what. Yeah, we have thought about it. And I, I, think, I think you're right. You know, if you can if you can get to the answer, then then you're done, and you're not continuing on some diagnostic odyssey trying to to get to an answer, right? And as a patient, you can you can see that as well. Maybe I wouldn't have had to get all those additional tests if if the answer was just forthcoming right away. Um, the the trials we did were in hospitalized patients, not in outpatients, and I think there could be differences in inpatients and outpatients. Um, and we tried to get at that in a way that might or might not make sense. Um, and that was by looking at overall cost of care. And it was no different with the rapid diagnostics, but in the grand scheme of things, they didn't, they didn't really add enough cost to do that. Or maybe they, maybe they took away something on the other end. And that's why it's, it's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't, we didn't look at it from, you know, specific utilization of say, other tests, but but you're right, just as you're able to more quickly streamline therapy, you probably would be able to more quickly streamline other testing. And, and so that, that's an interesting way of looking at it. It's, I'm not, I'm not uh, off the top of my head familiar with 
sort of metrics that would easily measure that. Um, but it's certainly something to, to think about. You know, the other, the other challenge is sometimes all those tests get ordered up front and it might be possible to, to stop some testing that might be underway because you already got the answer mm -hmm. from a rapid test, even though you had other tests ordered and they're already in progress. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're hold them. We, we do that with some of our tests until you see what comes back from the original rapid test. And then if you don't get an answer, move on to the more complicated test. So I think we need to be thinking about um, that type of approach in healthcare. It's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of a throwback question to earlier in the conversation. Uh, I am getting to the end here. So uh, <laughs> you, you can go, you'll be able to go home for dinner. <laughs> um, I'm not worried about dinner. <laughs> uh, when you have a panel, a large panel, so let's take a, a enteric panel. You know, it has bacteria, it has viruses, it has parasites, it has a whole array of potential pathogens, and each of those pathogens may apply to different populations. So I have a patient that um, you know has diarrhea that's gone on for five days, and I'm concerned, and I really want sort of the the, the run of the mill bacterial pathogens that are common in my community, but I don't necessarily want all these other viruses, and I don't necessarily want all these parasites. Um, is it appropriate to run part of that panel? Actually, you'd run the whole panel, but only report part of it and have a cost differential depending upon what they ordered. So you would expand your algorithm a little bit for bacterial pathogens, you know, viral pathogens, parasitic pathogens, or at least chronic versus acute pathogens, something like that. So you could actually order half the panel. And, um, is it appropriate for a laboratory to report half and not report the other half? Yeah, and this is a very interesting question. Um, so sort of making custom panels, I, as I mentioned before, there are labs that have done that, that have split out components of the panel to make sort of sub panels and offered those as tests. I think um, that's, that's certainly possible. Uh, the considerations would be multiple. One, uh, the person who's selling you the panel, you know, are they going to sell you the panel for the same price no matter what you're using off of it? So that's a consideration for the lab. Um, you have to build an ordering and reporting infrastructure that makes that happen, obviously. Um, and there's also the, the sort of philosophical piece of, of whether the lab is blinded to the remainder of those test results or whether they're seeing them. Um, because uh, you know we we know from old stories with say chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea, which was the same conversation years ago. You know, what if you just want to test for chlamydia trachomatis and you don't care for the Neisseria gonorrhea test? Okay, fine. But if the laboratorian's looking at someone who has gonorrhea and it wasn't ordered, that puts them in a really difficult position. Um, and so maybe the GI pathogen panel organisms aren't quite at the same level, <laughs> but you can, you can imagine that that question will come up. So hidden is better, I think, so that you, know, you just see what's ordered and you're just dealing with what's ordered, like is done with many serologic assays uh, that have uh, many, many of the particular components uh, on panel. But then you also have to think about uh, guiding your clinicians through appropriate test utilization. So if you're going to make some panels out of it and you're saying, I know when I only want these, I know when I only want those, you have to make sure that they're able to identify those patients and get that done correctly. And that makes sense. And that can be complicated as well. In some ways, you could argue that having a one size fits all is maybe easier. Uh, there's just one test, it's for everybody. But I see your point um, that, that you could certainly come up with examples where you might want to customize. So these, I think, are things to, to think about. They're possibilities for, for labs. There isn't a, a one-size-fits-all or a rule about how it has to be done, uh, but you have to, to keep all these pieces in mind as you, as you go about being creative, I guess, with uh, panels. <laughs> You know, Mayo has always been known for uh, blood culture developments and, you know, helping us all improve our blood cultures. You know, looking at what you do with molecular testing and rapid susceptibility testing and even, you know, sort of rapid multi-talk testing now in blood cultures has changed so much in the last 10, yeah. 10 years. 
um, if you could wave a ma magic wand, what additional tests would you like? Oh, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to poke at blood cultures for a minute here. Sure. The uh, blood culture systems that we have are 1990s technology. We need advances in blood cultures, the actual instruments that incubate the blood cultures. We've had some like the Virtuo that are a bit of an advance, but we need some major advances. It's been about 30 years. So companies making blood cultures, I think we can do better with, with blood cultures uh, themselves. Um, I think that the, the rapid diagnostics on blood cultures have been a tremendous advance. And I think you'll see more advances there. You know, we've shown that speed matters, um, building out the panels, because sometimes you have off panel organisms, both for the rapid phenotypic susceptibility um, panels, missing drugs, as well as for the, the um, uh, molecular panels. But the other advance that I see coming is direct for blood. And this will really change things. Um, there are lots of really interesting technologies out there that will, I think, enable us to go even faster if we can skip the step of having to do the blood culture incubation. And they'll be able to identify what's in the patient's blood, I hope, and um, hope, hopefully get us quick susceptibility results in some way, shape, or form. So I'm enthusiastic for these. These will bring their own challenges. Blood cultures are not terribly expensive to perform, and most of them are negative in most labs. Um, so as we move to advanced diagnostics for direct from blood, we'll be dealing with something else. Um, but we'll have to do more studies to look at value and to look at where they make sense and where they make a difference. And I think the field is well poised to be able to do that. Well, Dr. Patel, I could listen to you all day and uh, I would actually like to keep asking questions of you all day because you're such a wealth of experience and knowledge and I've benefited uh, significantly and hopefully all the listeners will appreciate uh, your exchange here. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's my yeah, pleasure. It's great.